<clears throat> Father, thank you that your word is a hammer and it's fire. And sometimes that's exactly what we need on our hard hearts, on our stiff necks, and on our stubborn minds. God, may your word speak to us, change us, mold us, shape us. God, the, the way we think and the way we act, what may... May today, by the power of your word, we be changed. Help us, Lord. We love you and thank you. And these things we pray in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Today's Bible study should come with a, a caveat or a warning. Going through Scripture, especially 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, it should say at the beginning of the chapter, this is only for leaders don't tell the congregation these things. Because it's not nice, it's not fun, it's not warm and fuzzy, it doesn't keep people in their seats. The section of scripture we're going to look at today is going to hit some of us square in the face. I'm telling you like a... I know it did for me, the first time I heard it. And I want you to know that as we go through it, as a pastor, I've learned so much from this section of Scripture and how to deal with people, but it takes time. Now, for you that are in ministry or thinking about being in ministry, reading this is going to be like one of those things where you're like, I don't know how to do this. That's a hard thing to do. Now, you might be thinking, what are you even talking about? I'll get to it. Stay with me. I, I wanted to give you that preparation, that caveat, because some of you guys are going to get your feelings hurt. And I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings, not without the Holy Spirit of the living God doing it for me. You with me? Verse 20 of chapter 2 of the book of 2 Timothy starts... But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. Here, Paul, trying to paint a picture as he sends this letter to the pastor whom he raised up, says, listen, you have to remember something about ministry. Now, the really cool thing for me is, before I even finish that thought, is every person that I've ever had teach at this church, they always say the same thing. I say, what did you sense? What was your feeling on the, on the message that you delivered to the church? And uh, they always say, your people can handle anything. That's what I love about teaching at your church. Your people are used to getting the unfiltered, unadulterated power of the word. You don't have to dance around it. You can just deliver it and they receive. Mm. I like that. I'm not afraid to tell you guys the truth. I'm not afraid to hurt some feelings. I'm not afraid if some of you guys get jostled and have your apple cart turned over because you're not mine you're God's and if it's good for you to be away from church for a season while the enemy has a field day in your life and turns your life upside down so you come running back to this church or whatever church I'm glad that I could be God's voice in that for a little while now if that sounds rude or harsh I am sorry because I don't want to However, back to Scripture, there is some for honor and some for dishonor. I imagine the letter goes something like this. Dear Paul, the church is growing in the number of people that are coming, but the strangest thing is happening. There's some people that are going to church and they, they're trying to sell Mona V. There's some people, they're going there and, and you, they even flat out told you, I'm looking for a wife. There's some people that are going to church and, and they got ulterior motive. You can see it. Now, I confront them on it, but they swear it's not the case. And Paul, putting his young pastor, quote, son, at ease, says, listen, 
in every great house, there's gold and silver, but there's also wood and clay. You know, there's a, there's a toilet bowl. It's not a vessel of honor. It's a vessel of dishonor, but it has its uses. Huh? There's that vase that you get your wife flowers and you keep. That's a vessel of honor. It's decorated. There's vessels in every great house and some of you guys are full of flowers. I'm not going to finish. <laughs> Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself of the latter... I just made points with my wife, didn't I? <laughs> just so you guys know, I go home and she gives me the checklist. Don't ever say that again. Don't ever say that again. Don't ever... On Wednesday night, she was like, Ruth is the most wonderful, tender book in the world, and you manified it! <laughs> Don't manify Ruth! <laughs> you said this and you said that. She keeps me. Keeps me where I need to be. I pity anybody that doesn't have a relationship with their, with their spouse like that. That can't have a good old fight and finish it. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So let me give you the uh, picture, the uh, he says, yeah, people are going to come in and they're going to be full of not flowers. But the church is supposed to be a place where people can cleanse themselves. You come in here and you leave it. This is what the message the Lord gave me this morning. And hear God take this and, and hear God take this. You leave it at the foot of the cross. You cleanse yourself. Well, doesn't God do the cleansing? Listen, let me un make you understand something. There's a dichotomy that happens in Scripture that so many people confuse. For the Bible says that Christ died for the sins of the world. He died for our sins. And upon acceptance of Christ as Savior, your sins are now washed away. But yet there's another Bible verse that says... That if you confess your sins, that God is faithful to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. <clears throat> Meaning, should I have to continually confess my sins? Why do I have to confess my sins if he died for my sins? Isn't it like him dying more than once then? Am I not cleansed from my sin? Listen to me. Scripture is not confusing, even though it's unclear on that matter, if you're looking at just two scriptures. Christ died for your sins, and upon acceptance of Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are going to heaven. For the Father will no longer see your sin when you get face to face with Him on the day that your heart beats its last. But what you do between the time you receive Christ as your Savior and the time that you die, that's up to you. The Holy Spirit will help you, but He will not drag you. The Holy Spirit will lead you, but He will not force you. And going back to sin, 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 it clogs, it clogs, and it, it binds, and it angers, and it fills you. You don't look like somebody who's saved. I know. It's because I'm not spending any time with God. I'm not reading His Word. Every time I go to church, that pastor says something I don't like. Is that guy saved? Maybe so. Well, how do you know? You don't know. And that's the point Paul's trying to make. Watch as he continues. Verse 22. Flee also, talking to Paul, Paul talking to Timothy now, I want you to flee youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. He wants his young pastor to seek love, peace, faith, with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Well, how does he know who's calling on the Lord out of a pure heart? He doesn't. Watch what he says now. 
but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes knowing that they generate strife. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes knowing that they generate strife. Timothy. I wrote a list that every pastor should avoid. Now, I'm going to be talking to the pastors and maybe the deaconesses, the wives of ministers here. This is what you avoid because this is what you will have to deal with in the future. You all. Now, I can be sneaky or I can just tell you flat out. Now, I'm hoping that some of you guys that are on the other side of this will go, uh-oh, that's me. And you can cleanse yourself. Leave it alone. Give it up. Become a vessel of honor instead of dishonor. Are you saying, Pastor Ryan, that there's vessels of dishonor in our church? You bet. Who are they? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. I don't know anybody's state of salvation. I know mine. You got to know yours. I can't tell anybody who's saved and who's not. Think on that one for a while. Listen to me. Here are the areas of dis debate. Here are the areas of discussion. Here are the areas of issues. Here are the things that Paul is telling Timothy to not dispute with people. Because all they do is generate strife. Ready? Number one, relationships. Relationships. Do you know how many questions I get in the course of a month about relationships? Well, can we hold hands? Should we kiss? Do Christians dance? Should we date? Should we listen to me? Listen to me. Let's aim for the moon. I say. The moon is high above the earth. You're never going to touch it. You're never going to be there. So let's aim for that. You don't need to find a wife. God will find one for you. You don't need to look for a husband. God will bring him to you. Oh, but Christian Mingle. I have a friend that went on Christian Mingle. <laughs> You're laughing, huh? Yeah. Let me tell you something. I guarantee you, half of the singles in here have been on that. <laughs> Well, what should I do? I mean, it's, it's, I mean, this is a small church, you know. There's a church up the block, and there's so many people, so many to choose from. Well, who's choosing for you? Well, God can choose, but, but, but God sometimes needs, I don't say a little help, but He's kind of leading me there. Listen, you don't have to do nothing. And when you find the man that you think it's the Lord... You can avoid him as much as you can. Because what kind of God do you think you serve? <laughs> I've got the perfect husband for you. But I'm going to keep you far apart. See, I've called you to go to Calvary Fort Lauderdale, but him to go to Calvary Deerfield. And that's where he is. <laughs> Come on. The Lord is like, are you kidding me? The Bible says it's not good for man to be alone. You women is fit right in there too. God doesn't want you to be alone. He wants you to have somebody to hold you and to love you and for every good thing. He wants that for you, but it's His time. There's no greater testimony. I love telling my daughter's testimony. She was 22 years, 22? 21 when, they, when she said, I do. They did no more than touch hands. I don't even say held hands for any length of time. The first time Austin's face came near my daughter's face was upon, you may kiss the bride. What a testimony. It can be done, ladies, whether you are previously, yes, been with a man, or no, not been with a man. Whether Pandora's box has been open or reshut. It doesn't matter. You can wait without having sex. Well, but here's the thing, I have, I don't want to hear it, I argue with somebody else. Well, I went to this church and they have a singles, they have a singles meeting at your church? Why, God needs help? Well, they deal with the issues of singles. Why? Because the Bible doesn't deal with it, right? Stop. Stop doing that to yourself. Well, I don't agree with you. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Okay, have fun. Hey, let me ask you a question. How's that working for you? How's that working? What relationship are you on now? How many guys? Oh, I see. 
Gentlemen, you will never, never know if she is the right one if you keep sleeping with them. Because the body's going to tell you she's not the right one, and the spirit's going to tell you she is the right one. No, you have that reversed. No, I don't. As soon as you have sex with a girl, men, the first thing is you're going to want to flee because getting married is a real serious step. And you're like, well, well I've already ruined it. And I, listen to me. That's not how it works. I know. I did it. I did not want to get married because I was sure I messed up. But my spirit knew she was the right one. But my body... Total quandary. Totally. I know. I've been there. I'm not judging. I'm telling you. I know. Next is money. That's my next. That's the next one. Hey, do I tithe gross or net? Whatever you want. How's that? Well, I mean, tithe means 10%. And uh, does that mean I have to give a full 10%? You don't have to do anything. Well, I just want to know. Okay. You sure you want to sit down and do this? Yes. Okay. Let's go in my office. Okay. We take out and I call. I call. We have, we have a, a bookkeeper named Julia. I say, Julia, could I have the tithe report for so and so? Sure. She texts it to emails it to me. I go, okay. You've never tithed to the church at all. Why are you asking about tithing for? Well, I just want to know what your opinion is. You've been here three years. Maybe it's time to start doing something. Okay. You don't want to tithe God. You just tip God then. Okay. Just leave ten bucks in a box once in a while. Well, why is that important? Scripture is pretty clear that everything that you have originated from God. If you will bless God with what he gives you, he will sanctify the rest of it. And you can do whatever you want with it. Well, I mean, what if I want to go buy a, a, a Land Rover? You tithe with the rest of it, you buy whatever you want to buy. It's your money. Well, would Jesus buy a Land Rover? <laughs> Listen, I don't know what he would buy if he had or didn't have. I know he'd buy something reliable, something that keeps his family safe. And I know one thing. He tithe! <laughs> <laughs> but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they... Right, 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 right. Okay, okay. Third thing. Doctrine. My least favorite of all of them. I don't mind discussing the other ones. Because it's, it's totally scripture. You can usually know when somebody wants to understand scripture or doesn't want to understand scripture. Bible says don't fornicate. Well, it's not fornicate because once we had sex, technically we were married. And that means we're not really fornicating because technically... You guys are like, no, you didn't. I've heard that m multiple times. Multiple times from men. The Bible says don't fornicate. It pretty much means don't have sex out of marriage. Well, fornicate such a harsh word. <laughs> money. You're just trying to, you know, make money. Yeah, it's because I get 3% of everything you put in that box and my bank account's blowing up now because... Come on, what do you want from me? <laughs> I don't make any. I don't make anything from what you put in the box. Stop! I'll, I'll destroy every excuse you can have, but yet, believe me, it's over and over and over and over again. I'm not going to argue about it no more. Okay, hey, listen, you pray about it as the Lord leads you. Doctrine, though. I hate that. I hate it because everybody uses it to, to twist Scripture. First thing is, they want to know about your, the Holy Spirit. Well, do you guys speak in tongues at that church? Do you believe in prophecy? You know, the Bible says... And they're going to give you their personal scripture on what the Bible says about... Are you guys Calvinists over there? Do you believe in the five points? Are you four-point Calvinists? Are you hyper-Calvinists? I just want to know before I... I ain't doing it. I'm not going to do it. Okay. How about worship? I like more of a traditional hymns-based worship. We went to your church and you guys, for a long time, you did the CD worship. You don't have a band, so you had the CD worship. That's why we stopped going to your church. We had uh, a guy that used to lead worship, his name was J.C. Conti, and he had minimal skills when it came to playing guitar and singing, but man, did he worship. But some people got stuck on the fact that he 
wasn't a real good guitar player or a good singer. So we left because, or we're not going to come back because, or are you going to do anything about, are you going to have a... And I say the same thing every time when it comes to the worship aspect of doctrine. It's not for you. It's not for you. We're not entertaining. It's not like, okay, here's the entertainment part, and now that you've been entertained, let me come up and beat you up. <laughs> That's not it. Paul is telling Timothy, not me telling you. I'm just acting as if I was, you know what I mean. Church discipline. I heard that one of your pastors was at a basketball game the other night and somebody heard him use a four-letter word. What are you going to do about it? You sure it wasn't me? <laughs> well, are you going to confront him on it? Are you going to confront him on it? No. So you're just going to complain to a lot of different people about how you can't stand that leadership or that leadership or that leadership, but you're really not going to do anything about it. You know the Bible says to confront somebody who's wronged you and, and if they ask for forgiveness you're supposed to forgive them. And by not confronting them you're actually doing a worse wrong than they did to you by parking in your spot. Or not saying good morning or whatever it is they did. Don't argue foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Verse 24, now the instruction, we'll leave that part of it. I'll throw that piece of paper away because nobody wants to hear that no more. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient. Give me your attention, please. A servant of the Lord, a pastor, an elder, a deacon, a deaconess, must be gentle and patient. And as they give you these things, you must, with a kind and gentle heart, understand two immediate things. One, they're either very sincere and are asking questions out of curiosity, or two, and more prevalent, trying to squirm out of their own sin and looking for justification for it, so they're going to argue with you about it until you give them the answer that they want. Have some people who were in leadership who don't believe in tithing. And it's one of the prerequisites for a servant in a church. Listen, if you're getting paid from the church, we expect at very least that you're going to tithe off of the money. If people's tithes are coming into the box and you're getting paid doing something for the church, I'm going to expect that you're going to be as responsible and give back what you've been given from people's money. And we've had people who say, well, I don't, I don't see tithing in Scripture. And I'll show them this, and they'll say, that's the Old Testament. And then I'll show them that, and they'll say, well, that's the wrong heart. They create their own doctrine. They create their own dogma based upon their own sin or their own personal preference or their own fear. Or their own, and you've got to be gentle, able to teach, and patient hoping that God so changes their heart. Why? Look at verse 25. Reading the end of 24, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so they so that they may know the truth. I'm patiently, as a pastor, as I minister, and I say things to you about relationships, money, doctrine, whatever, and you don't receive it, I'm supposed to be patient, kind, and gentle, hoping that God will open your eyes. Let me explain to you how it works. Let me go to the spiritual aspect of it. So many women used to come to our church, and they used to say... I wish you would call my son and talk to him. Maybe you can call my husband and talk to him because if you would talk to him, I know he'd get it because the other church we went to and what happened was we had a whole group of a dozen or so women when our church was a lot smaller whose husbands were wayward, but they were sure I could fix them. 
They were sure. If Oh, if my husband only. And I said, listen, the Holy Spirit's got to do it. He's got to. You give them my number. If they call me, I'll engage the conversation. But in the meanwhile, you just need to be praying and fasting for your husband, for your, for your wife, if they're not saved. Prayer destroys more strongholds than an argument. You see, because if I get into an argument, you ever meet somebody and they don't believe in God, and they're going to tell you why, and you go through this whole thing, and, and you argue them, and you out-argue them, and all of a sudden, they, you argue them into the kingdom. Don't you understand that somebody else can argue them out of the kingdom? Debating never caused anybody to go to heaven, ever. It's one of the things I don't like about certain ministries. They're going to tell you how to witness. Oh, you, 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 come to, you come to evangelism explosion, the way of the master. They're going to tell you, well, if somebody's a sinner, well, are you a liar? You guys know. And I love their ministries. I respect their ministries. But listen to me. If I have to teach you how to share Christ... You need to know him better. Because if you hang out with me for more than 10 minutes, you'll find out I'm a Christian. I'll just talk about it. You'll see something different. And that's how it's supposed to be. Greatest compliment I've ever seen anybody receive. You're in work, you're, at, you're in some place, and a few months go by, and you invite somebody to church, and they go... I knew there was something different about you. I knew, I knew it. I knew it. Anybody ever had that happen? It's the greatest feeling in the world. Like, man, yes. Witness holding up. Now, a lot of times you don't get close enough to somebody. You know, some people are those, those two-minute Christians. Hey, how you doing? My name's Ryan. Hey, I go to church. You want to go? Um, I ain't like that. I'm a relational guy. I build it. I, I become a part of the, of the scenery and, and with a different color. And they go... I knew there was something different. People at the gym, when they find out I'm a pastor, they always, you're a pastor? I knew there was something about you. I knew it. I love that. This is what he's, he's saying. God's going to have to give them, look again, verse 25, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them <laughs> repentance so that they may know the truth. Verse 26, And that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken, care, uh, taken captive by him to do his will. The people who argue about those things, they've been taken captive. They're in bondage by the devil himself, by the enemy of their soul. They are lying to themselves, telling themselves things. Now you are armed, minister, knowing that. You can't beat them out of the kingdom of hell. You can't. Let me tell you about tithing, you idiot. You don't know nothing about relationships. It's not going to help, man. This is why. And, and, and listen, I say this to you with confession. That's never been my. Man, at the early days of our church, I would be like, you go, you go, you go. What are you doing? I'm throwing people out. Why? I'm cleaning house, man. I don't think they're here for the right reason. You go, you go, you go. Throwing people out every week. My wife is like, you know, if you keep throwing people out of church, I'm like, I don't care. I want the people in my church to be safe. Some pastors I call, hey, I did such and such. Good job, man. Throw them out. You do it at your church? No, but I'm glad you do. <laughs> Find out, man. Other pastors tell you what they want you to do because they're too chicken to do it. At least somebody's doing it. <laughs> Leaving there, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to finish up in Matthew 13 because I want you to see what happens and what changed my whole perspective on. The bottom line is, we're going to, uh, 13 and, um, I'll tell you in a second. We're going to pick it up in verse 24. 13 and 24. Now, see, what happens is, the crazy thing about being a pastor is you start this Bible study, you start a church, and people show up, and, and you look at it, and you wonder, how come it's growing too slow? How come it's growing so fast? How come people are coming and going? How come there's people, and then the thing that confuses you more than anything else 
I'm telling you, the one thing that throws you the, the, the biggest curveball is you never know who gets the message and who doesn't. The guy that comes in with his Bible, the big smile, and shakes everybody's hands, man, he's been here. You think to yourself, oh, this guy's going to make it, man. Look at him. This guy's going to make it. And then he's gone. And you find out he's like smoking crack or something. And, and worse, man, I've had people that died. OD, and you're like, man, I thought that dude was. And then there's other people, and they come in and they're still drunk from the night before. Junior was like that. Junior's show is still drunk from the night before. I'm in church, man. I was like, he'll be gone soon. Don't worry about it. Man, you shouldn't let him come all drunk to church. I don't care. It's his hangover, not mine. But something happened, and God just. Got him. I didn't get him. God got him. I didn't argue him in. I didn't beat him. And I thought, as I grew in the Lord and as I grew as a pastor, I said, God, this is crazy. How do I reconcile this? Guys, you think you're going to get it. Some, this, is, this is my absolute favorite. You ready? Uh, and, it, 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 and it works both ways gender-wise. Let me, let me give you the, 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 the male version of it. The dude comes to... Let me give you the female version because it's better. <laughs> Woman comes to church and she's like, oh, I've been in so many bad relationships and I just, you know, I want to uh, really seek the Lord. Okay, so they come here and they're here for a few months and then they meet this guy. And they, they're afraid to tell me they met a guy because they hear me preach and stay away. But eventually they bring their quote-unquote boyfriend. And the first thing I say to boyfriend is, I go, really, um, show me that word in the, in the Bible. What are you talking about? The word boyfriend. Can you show it to me there? Well, it's not in there. So you're saying you don't exist. That's what you're saying. <laughs> boyfriend doesn't exist. Oh, good. So talk to me, non-person. And here what happens. They come here, they get the message, they fall in love with Jesus. Now they don't want to sleep with the woman. Now they want to make sure they're doing everything right. And the girl's sitting there going, I introduced you to the church. Thank you so much for introducing me to my church. I'm se- I want to get serious about it. I want to be a missionary. I just wanted a husband. <laughs> No, here's what the Bible says. And now she leaves. She goes back into the world to another church or wherever. And he's on fire for the Lord. And you you scratch and you go, now how did that happen? (laughs) Ministers, you know what I'm talking about, right? How many times have we seen this? And here's one of the things that, this is how the Lord explained it. And guys, please understand, if you have a certain Bible, see the letters are in red. And when when you see letters in red in your Bible, that doesn't mean Ryan said it. Okay? It's red like the color of his blood, because he's the one that said it. Okay? All offense intended. Another parable he put forth to them, them being the disciples, the apostles, or us, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Now, again, let me explain to you the parable situation. A parable is an earthly story depicting a heavenly principle. Okay? An earthly story depicting a heavenly principle. The Lord Jesus telling a parable said there was a man who plowed a field and put wheat in it. Wheat's good. Wheat feeds. Wheat is what you want. That's how you make money. But while he slept, the enemy came and put tares, otherwise known as weeds. Vines that grow up and choke out. They circle. The tear would circle around the base of the uh, wheat. You with me? He says... Now he explains it himself. I don't even have to continue. Verse uh, 25. No, 26. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servant of the owner came and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? 
How does it have tares? He said, you sowed wheat. How come we have so many weeds? Verse 28, he said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us to go and gather them up? Now, spiritually speaking, application-wise, hermeneutics, as we learned a couple weeks ago on a Wednesday, let's apply it. You all, the vessels of honor, are the wheat. The vessels of dishonor are the tares. Here I was, a young pastor, pulling tares and throwing them out. Pulling tares and throwing them out. Now please, super important, that's when you don't know who's who. When somebody makes it clear what they are, they get my foot square up their tookie and they get thrown out. When I don't know, that's when I apply this. If somebody's here and they've slept around, they've, they've bedded down with women, or they've robbed, or, or they, listen, you go. Go into the world, that's where you go. Scripture says, deliver them up to Satan for the destruction of their flesh in the hopes that their soul may be saved. That's not this. So please understand. Hey, you threw so-and-so. You said you never throw them out. No, I, I'm only throwing out people who I know. These are people who I don't know. They look, the problem with tear, it looks like it's, it's wheat. You with me? Okay. He said, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. You throw somebody out, you pull them up, you don't know who's going to get the message. You don't know which is the boyfriend, which is the girlfriend. You don't know who's going to get it. You don't know who's going to be a vessel of honor, a vessel of dishonor. They can cleanse themselves. That's the great thing about being a vessel of dishonor. He just said, you can cleanse yourself. Any service, any time, you come up here and you leave it at the cross. And now... That person who came here for a wrong reason, with wrong intentions, they're cleansed, man. They're saved. Amazing, isn't it? Verse 30. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And at that time, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. You see, the, you see the spiritual picture the Lord Jesus is saying? It's okay. Let me give you another scripture. Many will say to me in that day, didn't I, didn't, I, didn't I know you? Didn't I do this? And he will say to them, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. I never knew you. You mean I could have been doing something fun on Saturday night and not wake up early and go to church? You mean I went to church every Sunday for almost two months and I still wound up going to hell? Verse 31. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Oh, give me your attention. You who come from a big church, understand what the parable says. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It's a little bitty thing. But when you plant it, mustard, guys, so you know, it's just a bush. He says, but this mustard seed turns out to be a gigantic tree where the birds take shelter or shade in the branches. What does that mean, Pastor? Listen to me. He says there's a freaky thing that happens sometimes with churches. They get so big, you can't tell not just the wheat from the tear. Now you don't do nothing when you know somebody's a tear. And the birds, which in Scripture snatch the seeds away, hurt. They hurt. They poke eyes out. Birds are negative in Scripture almost every time except for wings as eagles. He said they sit in the shelter and the shade where everybody else is supposed to be receiving salvation and they're looking for somebody to take out. 
Now, does that mean that big churches are bad? Listen, I don't know. I know plenty of bad churches that are small. I know plenty of good churches that are big. I don't judge one church from another church. That's not my job. Here's what I know and I've seen coming from a big church. Man, it's really hard when you don't know everybody in the church to keep the wickedness out. It could be a full-time job just throwing people out. Well, maybe you just shouldn't throw people out and you should just let them grow the wheat and the tear together. Not if somebody's made it clear they have no intention of repenting. And now they're taking people down. Do you understand? This is not my words, guys. This is the Lord's words. Why do you think so many people leave this church and go back to a big church? There's accountability here. I'm going to call you out. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to meet you. I'm, hey, is everything okay? Now, I get, even here you could hide. I mean, there's enough people to hide around here. But eventually somebody's going to come up to you. Hey, how's it going? We had one person leave our church, one family leave our church. A woman was a great servant. She loved the Lord and she served so faithfully. It was so sad. And her husband, she said, my husband just doesn't want to go to church anymore. And I said, that's okay. The only time I would ever tell a wife to disobey her husband is Sunday morning. You get to church Sunday morning. She said, can you call him? I said, absolutely. Because he was a good guy. He had come to church. I said, bro, what's up, man? He goes... I don't like people talking to me. <laughs> How are you doing? What you doing? We miss you next week. Everybody's getting in my business. I was like, you got me. I'd never heard that one before. I was the first guy. I said, okay, I leave. <laughs> what can I tell you? Come to church, I'll tell nobody to talk to you. <laughs> hey, uh, when so-and-so comes in, guys, don't say nothing. <laughs> Makes him uncomfortable. Sad to see them go, because that woman was so... She, in the early days of our children, remember her, Mama? She was so faithful. You remember who I'm talking about? showed up early and, and, and when we were at the a hotel we'd have these little gates that we'd set up and she'd show up a half hour early and set up the gates and make sure all the kids stuff was cleaned she went by I was like ah you can do that at a big church also you can just go in and out and nobody says and you think you're doing fine especially if your kids go to a Christian school man that's the best then you're definitely going to heaven let me tell you <laughs> what you gotta do is show them the bill <laughs> <laughs> it's like a tithe <laughs> another parable he spoke to them verse 33 the kingdom of heaven is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till all was leavened you hear what he said there when you know what leaven does anybody know what leaven is yeast you guys ever cook you guys ever bake? Listen, I'll tell you this great story. I've told this story a few times in our church's history, so some of y'all remember it. I used to work in a pizzeria growing up. And the guy gave me the keys. I was very trustworthy. And before we left, the last thing we'd make is the dough for the next day's pizza. And we'd have the big machine. You know what I'm talking about? And we put the, this in. I can't tell you the secret recipe is, but... <laughs> And the last thing we'd take, we'd have this block of yeast and cut it out and make sure we knew how much we'd throw it in and the thing would mix it, mix it, mix it, mix it, mix it, mix it, pour more water, turn it over, mix it, mix it. And then we'd take out the thing and put it on the counter and cut it up into pieces and roll it up and then the next day you'd, you'd make the pie. But before we left, we'd have to take, we'd have these metal pans and we'd take the pizza dough, put it in the metal pans and guess where it would go? In the cooler. Well, one day, we didn't have any metal pans left. So about half of that dough, I'll do it tomorrow. But I didn't put it in the cooler. <laughs> have you ever seen what a little piece of yeast does to a big piece of flour? <laughs> The thing was like the blob. <laughs> and I didn't work the next day, and my boss, and there was like no cell phones back then, but I got to work, and let me tell you what. Ooh, was he mad. Was he mad. 
<laughs> little bit of yeast. It's a little leaven. That's all it takes. A little leaven. If you don't get the leaven out, and in Scripture, leaven is a type of, a picture of, a similitude of sin. Cleanse yourself from the latter. A little sin destroys the whole thing. If you know you have somebody who is here to sin, you get them out, the Lord Jesus said. For a little yeast, you know how the old saying, one bad apple spoil the whole bunch? That's a biblical saying. Get it out. He says, when you don't know, don't, don't you see what he's saying? When you don't know, let the wheat and tear grow together. Be careful of the big freakish thing. What do you mean big freakish thing? Listen, remember I said the mustard seed was really tiny? But this mustard seed, instead of growing into a bush with mustard plant on, with that mustard leaves, it grew into a big freaky thing. He says, be careful of that too. And when you know where the leaven is, get it out. You see how the Lord Jesus put this? Why? Because that's the magic of Scripture. That's the power of God's Word. There's no question left undone. And watch what he said. Um, verse 34. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and with a pa without a parable he did not speak to them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, and I will utter things kept secret from the foundations of the world. So misunderstood. So many people hate this section of Scripture. Why didn't he just say it straight up? Why is he speaking in riddles? Because some people don't want to know the truth. And if you really don't want to know the truth, guess what he's not going to do? He's not going to argue you into the kingdom. Because the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be patient, willing to teach, loving to all, in case God grants them repentance. He's not going to argue. No problem. You don't believe my doctrine? It's not my doctrine. It's God's doctrine. Have it your way. There is the picture of how you're supposed to be a minister. How incredible it works. Continuing, verse 36, and here's where we're going we're gonna to do communion right after this. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. I love when he does this, and he only does this three times in Scripture. The disciples come to him and they go, I hate when you do this. What are you talking about? <laughs> they do. There's a few times he, he tells these parables and, and they walk over. And I could see the scene. It's got to be a great scene, right? Here's all the people and he tells the parable. And there's the apostles shaking their head. Yes, that's right, that's right. And then they, all the people leave and they go, What the heck are you talking about? <laughs> what does that mean? I hate when you do that. Explain that to us, please. Verse 37. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. Who sows it? Who's that? Am I sowing it? No. I'm just giving you God's Word. So who's got to turn the light on? That's it. I can't do it. It's not me. Verse 38. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. He didn't pull no punches, did he? The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out His angels and will gather out of His kingdom all the things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I didn't want to hear that! Oh, I didn't want to hear that. I hate when he does that. Oh, can't you soften it a little bit? Are you sure you want to know the meaning of this? Yeah, yeah, tell us the meaning. Okay, here's the meaning. When everything goes down, I'm sending angels out to collect all the make-believers. And I'm going to put them in a big bundle and I'm going to throw them in a furnace of fire and burn them for eternity. Thanks. <laughs> now I know. Now you know. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. He who has ears, let him hear. 
You have ears, let him hear. I have ears, then you better hear. What if I don't have ears? Guys, hand out the uh, communion elements. Hey, communion. Here's what the Bible says about communion. Let a man examine himself. Examine. I love about Scripture. Here's the window of opportunity. You looked in the mirror of the Word. You saw yourself. Now you have the opportunity to change. How awesome is that? It's awesome, isn't it? <laughs> if you're one of those, if anybody's heart was touched, poked, pricked, prodded, anything, the greatest thing, I remember being in church and having pastor teach something about a sin I was involved in. You guys could go ahead and handle it out. And I remember thinking to myself, this, I, I remember feeling this pressure upon my life. Have you ever done something in the world so horrible? Thank you, bro. Thanks. Use the tissue and everything. I like that. If you ever got a traffic ticket, here, I got one. Just came to me. You ever driving and you're talking or you're texting or something like that, and all of a sudden you look up and the light's like just turning red, and you blow through it and you look in your rearview mirror and it's got one of the cameras? <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? And you're like... Argh! And you wait, and you got, that, you got that heaviness on your heart, that weight on your shoulders, because you know you're going to get a $300 ticket, some, some, depending. You know it's coming, and you're just waiting for it. Right? Amen. That's how I felt. I felt when Pastor was talking about this particular sin that I was engaged, fully entrenched in, I felt this, this heaviness like, what am I going to do? He's talking to me. I know it. And at the end of the service, he said, just stop. Just stop. Just stop. Why didn't I think of that? For me, one of the biggest things was the, t was the taxes. I'm such an anti-establishment type of person. And to pay the government, who I know they're going to do something stupid with the money anyway, I wanted to come up with every single excuse not to pay taxes. I did. I'm just telling you flat out. And I remember Pastor Bob teaching one time about render therefore to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give the government its due. The, the Bible said, and I'm like, no, man, I'm, I'm not funding abortions. I'm not going to give money to, you know, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And remember that pressure of knowing I was being completely disobedient to the word. Ooh. And he said, so just do it. Okay. Hire a proper accountant, get me all the tax write offs I can, and render to Caesar, therefore to Caesar's. And I had no lack. Because the truth of the matter was, I, I really, wasn't that anti-government. I was just really pro-money. <laughs> That's the truth. But I, I, I told myself I was anti-government, and I gave myself all the reasons why. But the truth of the matter was, I just didn't want to give my money. I hate giving out my money. If you come from the type of background that I come from as well, where you were, I mean, growing up, uh, you know, I wouldn't say we're impoverished, but we're very lower middle class. You know, you, you, you wore your clothes often because you didn't have that many pairs and you didn't know where the mortgage was coming from or the rent or, you know, you, you know when you get a job and you all of a sudden got a couple of bucks in your pocket, it, it, it messes with your brain. It's like now you're, you become fearful to be broke again. When you're broke, you don't care because you don't have nothing to worry about. But once you got money, now all of a sudden you're worried because now you got money to protect. And you swore, if I ever had money, I'm never going to be like that. Now all of a sudden you look at rich people and go, no, I know why they're like that. Fear. 
lack of trust in God's provision and purpose. It's a crazy thing. What you thought was going to be your freedom turns out to be your bondage every time. So, if I've reached enough people's personal space, don't take the communion yet. We'll take it together. We're going to let them um, worship, lead us in worship. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to just examine yourself. For you that know where I've touched you, where, where the Holy Spirit has touched you, where my words have gone forth, and by the power of your Spirit, you've now been moved. Tell God you're going to do better and ask Him for the strength to do it. For you, that, that pressure is on right now, ask God for freedom from it. It's the greatest thing in the world. The greatest thing that you can ever experience is just knowing the forgiveness of God. And if anybody here, and I don't know everybody, if anybody here is like, maybe I've been playing, maybe I really don't know Jesus as my Savior. Great time. Just say to God, this communion I'm taking, body and the blood is salvation. Look at the cup for a minute. When they're playing, look at the cup and realize that is the representation of, a, of the blood of Christ spilt so that you can have not just forgiveness of your sins, but freedom from your sins. You know that's two different things, guys? There's forgiveness of sin and freedom. This is the representation of the broken body of our Lord. It's got holes in it. It's burnt. It's broken. And, and it's unleavened. No yeast. You're taking what is pure, but broken for you. And you're going to take it. And you're giving God that symbol very much a, a, a wonderful exchange here. Please don't do this. The Bible says if you do this with the wrong attitude, with the wrong heart, you pronounce judgment upon yourself. Only do this if you're serious. Don't do it because you're embarrassed. There's a little cup in front of you in the, in the chair. Just put that thing down. Just leave it there. Put, put the bread in your pocket. Clean it out later. You've got to be serious. Think about the things that we talked about. Lead us in worship.
Me 